Smooth, my T.1, welcome back, Lagos. If you just joined us, you are just in time. It's time for Freshly Press 981. And yes, Lagos, you are welcome to be a part of our conversation. This morning in the studio, we have with us Gwalaho Adinogat. He's uh, at Mr. G. Press. Good morning. Good morning, Kaede. Good morning, Gwalaho. Great to see you on this lovely Monday morning, the first Monday in the month of February. Good morning, Lagos. Thank you very much for tuning in. This is Freshly Press 981. Just to let you know, at this point, no phone calls, but you can send in your messages on WhatsApp. And WhatsApp number is... 0809-444-0981. Also, you can reach out to us on Twitter. We are at Smooth981FM. And you can use the hashtag Freshly Press 981 to be a part of this conversation. All right. All right. Thank you very much. We dive straight in. All right. Now, before we move on to what was possibly the biggest story this weekend we start with one that also made headlines last week and it's right here in lagos state lagos lawmakers executive and rift as tinubu governor's advisory council intervene now that story is from the vanguard i'll just give you a few details and then well on if you don't mind just um you know giving your thoughts on this now if you remember last week a seven day ultimatum was issued by members of the Lagos State House of Assembly to Governor Ambode to appear and defend actions over alleged impeachable offences and that actually expires today mm -hmm. but good news well over the weekend um, the leader of the party of APC Bola Ahmed Tinubu and members of the Governor's Advisory Council met over the weekend and it was said that the rift was you know calmly mm -hmm. calmly the fire was calmly doused and all things are fine in Lagos State what do you have to say about this? Well, you know, at, at least I'm glad that this has come to an end and it's come to an end quickly as well, too, within a week or so, because it was only just uh, a week ago that we were talking about this incident where they said the, uh, that the governor had actually started spending money from the 2019 yeah. budget and it's an aberration or so, uh, uh, which violates the 1999 constitution or so. So he had been given a week ultimatum to, to appear be, before the, yeah. the, the Lagos State House That's of Assembly so, yeah. and to address the issue. So and this was obviously because of the budget that had not been presented for quite a while now and it's very unusual for we to have in Lagos State budgets not being presented before the year anyway. So um, good enough. Uh, as a, last week as well, I think it was on a Thursday or Friday, we had uh, members of the civil society group of some civil society group in Lagos anyway, yeah. turn up at the uh, gates of the Lagos State ha Harvest House Assembly yeah. as well too, in support of Governor Ambody as well too. I found out, you know, of course, you have to have his supporters anyway, going out to protest and complain about the, it's, it's, uh, the threat of, um, of an impeachment or so. So, you know, and they had one of the members come out who said, well, they were going to try and resolve this amicably or so. And of course, that process carried on. On, on Friday, this article actually reads that um, the deputy governor did actually meet with um, some members of the House of Assembly yeah. to smoothen things out as well before today. And on Saturday as well, too, then there was a meeting between the, the, uh, the so-called governor's advisory, advisory council. council. Oh. I, I mean, you know, I've heard this governor's advisory council. They only come out when there are special situations <laughs> taking place in Lagos, such as when uh, Ambody was was wanted to go for the second term and yeah. the people did not actually want him to go for the second term. And I wonder who are these members of this governor's advisory council? The only really regular person that we see prominent yeah. out of the advisory council is, of course, uh, Bola Ahmed Tinubu, who is who is the, who the, is the, leader, of the, the leader of the party or so that's the only person that we see regularly anyway so you know it, it raises a lot of questions when we're talking about uh, running a democratic process and uh, you know this democratic process we're expecting to have a little bit of transparency in it as well too so it, it, it said the meeting was held on saturday uh, you know with the gac with also the uh, Bola Betinubu and some other members of, of the party as well too. We're also talking about the, the uh, uh, speaker, uh, the speaker of the House, uh, Lagos State House of Assembly as well too, was also present as well too, which is, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, so he was also present at the meeting as well too. So, and all of this was discussed as well too. But you know, the question that I was going to ask as well too, in the statement after the meeting was held, yeah. was uh, it was stated as well too that, you know, of course, uh, this was uh, Bola Ahmed Tinubu who made the comment saying that in a democracy,
there is always bound to be conflict yeah. and there are conflict resolution mechanisms that are in place and then it brings me to the question you start to wonder as well couldn't they have actually resolved this without actually taking it all the way to Bolatinubu first uh, bef without actually taking it to the GAC or the supposedly Governor's Advisory Council this could have been resolved way before exactly. so I'm a little bit surprised why couldn't they have done this they could have trashed this out these are these are these are uh, political party big wigs as well too and we're talking over issues as not passing the budget or so we could have Spending resolved this or spent without up. passing the budget yeah, these, are, these are heavy things and i don't think i mean they're not they're not particular to the party itself it mm -hmm. has to do with the people of lagos irrespective of your party Absolutely. affiliation Absolutely. if your governor or the state house of assembly thinks that uh, money being spent without proper due process being followed then it's definitely cause for concern so 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 when i think about it sometimes i think are there some people pulling the strings as well to behind the scenes as well to when we're talking about uh, institutions as well are there people pulling the, the strings beyond yeah. the people in the Lagos State House of Assembly, Assembly and everything is now being settled with them and they're now okay and henceforth we can move on now all right now MI from Akoka says just in response to what you just mentioned the lion of Bodilon has roared and everybody will get <laughs> in line it would have been quite embarrassing if the governor and the House of Assembly took their roof to the village square obviously compromise and agreement have been reached they will be all right in the end all right everybody will be all right in the end in lagos state hello ikemesit good Hi, to have uh, you on the show thank, thank you very, very much for coming. sorry you know um <laughs> you lagos. heard about the horrendous traffic, <laughs> traffic. if yeah, you're in traffic at the moment our sincere apologies and we hope you're keeping your company uh, on your journey all right moving on straight to the next story this is from the new telegraph the Accident Investigation Bureau, AIB, has commenced investigation into the Cavatin um, AW139 helicopter conveying Vice President Emil Shibajo that crashed in Kaba, Kogi State on Saturday. Yeah, um, uh, first of all, well, the story essentially just dwells on the, the details and the mechanics of the aircraft in question, but um, away from that, uh, we are very grateful yes. the vice president and um, his responsibilities all the time of the this campaign season so um, the various political candidates right uh, that are vying for office um, really have a busy schedule it's um, interesting in recent years um, our air safety record has, um, has regressed back to more manageable levels as it was so it's interesting to see what the accident investigation bureau um, is able to dig up um, uh, after their investigations as it were so it's it's just a, a, a wait and see yeah, which yeah I, well according to the company they've mentioned yeah. there was bad weather that um, caused the crash but at the end of the day we're still waiting for the reports from the mm -hmm. to yeah um, go along, go well you know uh, quite a lot of times you you what well, we have to give credit as well to, to to the pilot or whoever's flown it as yeah. well too because when we're talking about a crash landing as well it could have been very catastrophic and um but of course just as you said uh, we hope the investigation is going to go beyond just a bad weather uh, situation mm -hmm. because often at times I wonder if we really do go through the thorough investigations when we're talking about the uh, the investigation panels or actually carrying out their investigations that uh, they need to do a little bit more than that and the report actually says that there's going to be uh, a, a, a preliminary that you'll be getting after 10 days as well too so we do hope yeah, that they're really going to take their time as yeah, well so too that. and that they wouldn't actually just rush through this and just move on to the next as well too yeah. there must be recommendations and guidelines going forward thank you it's important you mention that Golan because many people have also highlighted the fact that when we have a VIP as it were in Nigeria you know in situations like this whether it be a crash kidnapping the response is very swift Mm. But the ordinary Nigerian, the man on the streets, you know, it's not so, not, I mean, it's great that they're doing this, but it would be great to see it across boards, irrespective of position or status in the country. Mm -hmm. All right, moving away from that and um, going on to our third story, this one is from The Guardian and it states that Lassa Fever Meningitis killed 26, infect 88. Now, the Lassa Fever and Cerebral Spinal Meningitis have claimed 26 lives and infected 88 others in 26 states and the Federal Capital Territory. Well, wow, not very good news right there. Well, no, not, not, not good at all. I mean, this is, uh, of course, talking about hygiene as well, to uh, the state of hygiene in, in the country as well, too. Um, 
uh, right now at the moment, according to the Nigerian Center for Disease and Control, anyway, the, as at present now, we're talking, we're only about how, um, how many days into the year so far. We're talking Just about, about 30, 31 plus, 31 plus four, days or so. Days. Yeah, and there's already been 42 deaths uh, that has been reported anyway um, so far. And uh, of course, there's been several outbreaks as well too, uh, just as you mentioned in 26 states. Yeah. Uh, at the moment, uh, uh, we have about 77 new cases that have actually been established. Uh, 24 in Edo, we have 28 in Odo, 5 in Ebonyi, uh, Enugu, Kogi, Rivers, Benue, Kwara, uh, Gombe, Kaduna, they all have incidences all uh, which has been reported in this, in, in this uh, uh, in this so far as well too. And then uh, it also says as well too that between the January, 1st of January and, and the 27th, we have 538 suspected cases of ailment, which has been reported in 16, in 16 states. And out of that 538, we do have 213 incidents which have been confirmed positive. Mm. And uh, 325 have been negative so far. So, you know, right now at the moment, we are on a rampage when it comes to Lassa fever and meningitis in the country. And what exactly is the Ministry of Health doing about this in, in order to ensure that we curtail this incidence and nip it in the bud? I mean, we, we need to do a lot more. We need to spend a lot more on our health uh, budget as well. So, of yeah. course, we know what our health budget is for 2019 is a very small fraction that we're spending on our health budget and and this says a lot anyway we, we need to do a lot more in terms of uh, safeguarding the lives of people exactly awareness health and safe health you know hygiene promoting yeah. hygiene yeah. awareness i'm not sure how many people um well i don't know if you know if the news has been spread apart from the statistics we get about the new cases in different states have you also heard reports about what the you know ministry is doing to create an awareness among particularly amongst in, in the rural areas where this is predominantly um, present absolutely because if you ask the question as well to the national orientation agency what are they doing in terms of sensitizing people as exactly. well to, are you hearing a lot of radio advertisement jingles or tv commercials on lassa fever i can't remember the last time i saw that we hear it's, a lot for the campaigns though well, well you know, of <laughs> so course that's more important at this present time isn't it than the lives exactly. of people yeah. unfortunately okay all right moving on to our fourth story and uh, um, this one you can mess it if you don't mind i know foreigners not prohibited from political campaigns now if you recall last week there was an outcry that the you know that the presence of governors isa musa of zinda state and zakiri umar of maradi state both from the republic of niger were at last thursday's re-election campaign of president Muhammad buhari in kano and the, we actually you know brought that report here on on freshly press we talked about this but according to INEC, they're not actually prohibited from political campaigning yeah, and this is per the INEX uh, legal officer, Ms. Carol Lopez, who said this while they were having stakeholders and the stakeholder forum in Joss. Um, so this is her reasoning, and this is a direct quote for her. She says, our law is silent on whether or not a foreigner can campaign for a candidate during the elections. Yeah. Since the law is silent about it, you can hold it as an offense against any candidate or anyone. Assuming without conceding that she is right, and I'm not going to pretend right here that I have checked the law, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I still think this was a very, very responsible remark on our part to say. If we well, on are whose, on whose part? Uh, on the part of the annex legal, legal right. officer. Okay. If this was, if this is actually the case, right? We can expand the boundaries of these arguments to its logical conclusions. Why example? Why, why example was the week before this? was the um the information minister and the apc senior brass complaining when the us and the united kingdom complained about the fact that um with the entire situation concerning the supreme court chief justice yeah. the the federal government essentially accused the us and the uk and the eu of interfering in Nigeria state affairs yeah. it technically okay. is allowed i mean they were not in Granted, they were not campaigning for a particular person in this case, but the point is you cannot just come out and say in an exercise which is only going to be, um, in, in an exercise in which Nigerians are only going to participate in, where we've had a debate in this country for the last three years as to why Nigerians, green card, I mean, 
green passport carrying Nigerians abroad cannot vote, for example, why would we tolerate the fact that there are foreigners who are intervening in some way in the electoral I'll process? But they're not voting though, they're just there it's to just show the their campaign. presence. It is, presence. See, so it is a political intervention whether you like it or not. So whether directly or indirectly. So, yeah, so these guys are two relatively unknown governors in you know of a particular country which admittedly even though it's a neighbor is does not exactly you know rank very high on the richter scale what's to say that if a very consequential person for example if say a former um if a former president of a western country who's yeah. very popular in nigeria decides to come in and pull his star power for any of the political parties what's to say going by miss carol lopez reasoning that that person is not allowed to say well, if you think about it, though, in light of Boko Haram and terrorists and its links to the Republic of, you know, of Niger and Chad, would you think that that was in consideration and say that we had their support in fighting the war against terrorists? It, it, I think. Okay. Again, okay. yeah. Again, that support does not entitle you to come out and intervene in the political exactly. conversation that Nigerians are having. Exactly. Well, we like have you. still, we have been complaining, for example, with the headsman crisis, when we had folks yeah. like the Cardinal State Governor say, um, um, well, the people who are perpetrating these attacks are not Nigerians. Yeah. And remember the question at the time we were asking was, how do you know? We already know, almost every Nigerian who is well-versed, you know, of the issues, knows and understands that we have porous borders, as it were. Mm -hmm. This is yet one more issue that will reinforce that fear that a lot of Nigerians have, that there will be a lot of non-Nigerians that could potentially be ferried in to participate in the process. If we're already ferrying in non-Nigerians to come in and campaign for us, what is stopping us from ferrying non-Nigerians to come out? All oh, right, okay, then, well, you're I, going I, to I just wanted something. to add very quickly as well, to, I, I think it's uh, undiplomatic anyway, if you were to have uh, uh, governors of another nation come in to take sides with a political party, mm. because at the end of the day as well, too, you really cannot take sides, you don't know who's going to win the election. Yeah. The same reason why you have the U.S., um, uh, Secretary General also come to Nigeria. He always ensures that he meets both parties yeah. if you're talking about resolving issues. Well, it would be fun to see but if another party actually occupies us or what our relations with Nigeria. Yeah, yeah. So, Just all right, we have to, we have to kill this story, but um, let's we have to get to our next stories. But let's take uh, some messages first. Don't forget your messages come to 0809 444091. This one here from Shego says, Good thing Bola Timungu Daos, the Lagos political fire. <laughs> Uh, that is what a good and responsible leader does. Seems some people want him, the cares to linger. To linger. Also, um, Femi had something to say about Golan's comments. I'm trying to get to it, but I think he's saying you're right. Those governors have no right nor need to have attended a political candidate's rally. It sends the wrong signal and shows they're willing to influence our elections. That's from Femi from VI. V. V. Adeboye says, that are you suggesting that once Buhari loses the election, the neighbor, neighboring countries won't support Nigeria again? The attendance of this governors at the rally was faulty. Um, that's from B. Adeboye. One more comment here before we move on to the next story. Hi, Golau. The members of the JC are not ghosts. They include all high ranking APC elected officials, are, and they're amongst the senators, vice president, federal ministers, the governor himself, speaker, former governor from APC, highest ranking house member from Lagos State. Thanks, Baba Sunday Scott. All right, so let's get on to our next story. This one here comes to you, Bola. It says, AFCC secures 40 convictions in January. This story comes from Premium Times. So it says, Tony Oiladi, uh, the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission uh, spokesman, says the commission reported 40 convictions in January. And they're saying that 20 more of the convictions, or rather 20 convictions, uh, followed from the Abuja office and also reported a little more. And uh, what are your thoughts about this in general? Well, I, I, I think... Uh, kudos to the EFCC. Anyway, we, we need to be seeing more of uh, more convictions, and we need to get uh, this making the headlines as well. To I, I mean, they need to blow their own trumpets uh, every once in a while, anyway, and let the people know that they're actually working. Also, I mean, you're talking about um, 40 convictions in the month of January alone, and they're saying 20 occurred in Lagos State, and um, a few others occurred in also Abuja as well too. But you know, it actually picks two high-profile ones that actually uh, that they've been able to uh, prosecute successfully, and we're talking about a former official of the INEC who allegedly, or not allegedly now, who was found guilty of actually um, money laundering 
charges to the sum of 264 million naira, which was supposed to have been part of the 150 million dollar uh, Desiani slush fund uh, that was released just before the 2015 elections then or so. So he's been convicted and uh, we're talking about a conviction of about 91 uh, years in jail or so. When we're also, actually there were two of them and not just one. And they were also talking about another gentleman uh, by the name of Ibrahim Sulaiman, who is uh, a fraudster and there uh, is, he was found uh, guilty of defrauding First Inland Bank, which is uh, former FCNB PLC, to the tune of 400 million naira or so. So, you know, uh, credit to the EFCC. All I'll just actually just wanted to say is that we hope to see a lot more convictions of uh, high profile cases as well to brought to a logical conclusion as well too and that's what we can actually hope for there was also another case as well too that was also mentioned as well too. we're talking about um, um, who else were we talking about there was okay yeah, there, there was several other uh, cases that was I'm also mentioned in the anyway, convictions that was mentioned but these are the two high profile ones that was mentioned credit to them we just want to see a lot more conviction. Do you think that we're going to see this on a monthly people. basis now? Because they say for the month of January, it's big old 40. So are we seeing something for February, maybe March, April? Well, you know, let's just say that we'll probably see this up until the election is concluded. And maybe right after that, then who knows what we're going no, to see. We'll just media trial. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's it. All right. Thank you very much for that. Part of our life. Let's move on to the next story. This one here comes to you, uh, the chemist. It says here, uh, fire burns on cleaned PVCs in Abia. INEC office. Uh, this comes from the Punch newspaper. So it says some claimed permanent voters cars have been reportedly drawn to inside the office of the Independent National Electoral Commission in Uma Ika, the Isialangwa South Local Government Area of Abia State. Yes, and uh, apparently the office that was burnt was an office that the local government workers relocated to after their former office was burnt four mm. years ago. So a bit of a, um, a bit of a trend there. Um, uh, and the fire started early, early hours of the morning. Um, the community was alerted to it, and some young people in the community was able to um, put the fire out. When you consider the fact that the election is really just around the, the corner, corner, and you know you, we've got well documented concerns as to the logistical challenge, challenges that INEC faces in terms of you know, delivering materials, in terms of getting permanent voters cards over to um, to uh, potential members of the electorate and all of the other associated issues that you know that 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 have arisen with respect to the election and um, this is a this this is going to be a real concern it's a real concern that you know a, a significant proportion of you know potential voters in this particular local government could be disenfranchised so close to the election so it will be interesting to see if I, Which has any, I was gonna ask yeah. that, do you think that they're going to reprint or does this mean that these guys are just I, I mean it's it's so late in the election cycle i don't know and i'm not going to pretend that i have any knowledge as to any potential contingency measures by INEC, but i want to imagine that this is something that they will take care of in some way. I mean, it's something that we could reasonably foresee, either you know, due, to, due to theft or damage. So we may not have, a, you know, may not have access to the voters' cards as that one of you. So it's something that could have been reasonably foreseen. And I hope someone at INEC has a plan to help, you know, those potential voters. You know, to also, they're PDCs. saying that uh, suspected woodlums poured fuel through the window. You know, uh, when the PDCs were kept, so we're hoping that we're going to see some arrests at some point. Yes, as well. Yeah, there's also a lot of possible targets with it as well. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much for that one. Let's uh, move on to our next story. Before we do that, don't forget, Lagos, your messages once again come to WhatsApp at 0809 And uh, this one here comes back to you, Bolan. Uh, it says here Shake up in Nigerian army, 15 generals affected. It comes from the Premium Times. Your thoughts about this? Well, um, yes, uh, the article actually says that uh, there have been uh, another reshuffment or redeployment two months after a similar exercise was carried out, and this time around, uh, 103 senior officers, including top generals, were redeployed from the Boko Haram War. And one of them that uh, was mentioned here is a, a, a major general by the name of Abu Bakr Tafa who has just been redeployed from the war front and is now at operating at the Martin Luther 
Hagawa International Leadership Peacekeeping Center or so. There was another uh, Muhammad, Muhammad as well too, who has actually been redeployed as well too. So there have been quite a few military men that have been redeployed. And I think positions. Yeah, to different positions as well, taken back from the war front. I think it's only natural or only right as well to that you have this redeployment done every once in a while anyway I, 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 it's a general procedure or in, in a regular procedure that normally occurs as well too that every so often you redeploy those at the war front to get uh, refreshed as well too and you bring Which in was supposed to, i was going to ask you that what does this mean in the fight against the insurgency? well what it means is that you know you reinvigorate the fight against boko haram as well too. we're bringing in new fresh uh, military men as well too and so of course it uh it uh it uh, puts new lease of life into the fight against boko haram and of course we know that we've been having a lot of issues as well too. we've not been very successful at uh, at the fight against boko haram so of course and we uh, we also remember as well too that there's been a lot of uh, complaints by our military men as well too they, they're not being redeployed quickly enough as well too and they're staying too longer than they had expected okay. to have uh, stayed at the battlefront or so. So, you know, seeing this redeployment is a good move and uh, we hope to see a lot more of that as well to, to, to inspire the military as well to and reinvigorate the men as well to. But as you fight. say, it's a good move. Yes. It's, it comes just barely two months after the civil exercise was done. You know? Yes, when you have that, then it doesn't necessarily mean that we're talking about the same men that have been redeployed, obviously. It must have been, of course, uh, different sets as well that have been redeployed. Uh, one, the operation was done two months ago, and now we're having another set being redeployed as well, too, which is good. It's only natural. I mean, if you have if you have abled men and uh, your, your military uh, men are uh, sufficient enough, you should actually have uh, regular redeployments anyway. Oh. All right, thank you very much for that one. Before we get to our messages, let's take one more story. Uh, this story comes to you, Kenneth. Uh, this one here says, Serap sues Fashola for failing to name one way contractors as story comes from the Crunch newspaper this morning. What are your thoughts about this? Yeah, um, so the suit was filed at the Federal High Court here in Lagos just on Friday, and Serap um, had made the demand in January following a claim by the former vice president of the PDP presidential candidate has called the worker that some contractors were awarded electricity contracts. Um, well, some contractors who were awarded electricity contracts disappeared before being fully paid for the con um, bef after being fully paid for the contracts. Four thoughts on this. Um, first, the court has to determine whether this actually happened. Because it's basically an allegation at the moment. Okay. Yeah, it is speculation. It's, it's an allegation at the moment. An allegation with a tint of political intent. So you know, you know, you know how. How, how much salt we should take those with. Um, secondly, did Serap make a freedom of information request and the Ministry of Power, Works and Housing refused? Because I think for situations like this where you're trying to determine what the budgetary process or what the procurement process was like, um, is always good that there is a condition precedent. You know, it's, it's a matter of law these days. Is it in the public interest to, to know this? I would say yes, but then again, it's just speculation. And then finally, if so, is the court the right venue? We have investigating agencies for this. Mm -hmm. you know, if no one has actually carried out a proper investigation on this, this may be tantamount to turning the court into an investigating agency. That's not a, a rule. Our courts are typically very, very enthusiastic about taking. So it's be interesting to see if there's any mileage in this. What about it also? This is a political high season. Mm. So a lot of these things do go up in my All right, thank you very much for that one. I'm tired of talking right, about thank, thank you, Kemese. Before we go, before we get tired, we still have a politics coming up throughout this week, every week. Yeah, yeah, this week yeah. from 7.30. But before we go, um, we have this one from Wally. Wally was saying that Nigel, former British MP, appeared in one of Trump's campaigns. So maybe it's okay. So looking at the international and, scene. And, and, and there was a lot of outcry as well, the way that happened. I'll, I'll, I'll Plus, that is the United States of America. All right. Okay, final one here. Unfortunately, we cannot take any more of your comments, but thank you so much for um, being a part of this um, show. Chika Jina from Leki says, when the news broke yesterday that the intervention of Tinubu has put to rest the impeachment proceeding against Ambali, I felt sorry for Lagos. So the 28 billion naira that the house was accused of has been swept under the carpet and also the accused by the house that the governor has spent 20% of the budget without approval has also been swept under the carpet. For how long?
from shall lagos state be under the influence of one man that's from chica in lekki but thank you so much lagos thank you for your comments thank you for your tweets thanks our fantastic analysts thank you so much for our at mr g quest and thank you chemist at george ike on twitter Lagos is still here. It's still your smooth breakfast on Smooth 98.1. Kaya Day and myself are still here. And very shortly, Tega will be joining us on the, in the local room. Stay tuned and we'll be back. <laughs>